Uh, okay, so one of the questions that we got uh, prior to the show, uh, we got a couple of really good gauge R and R questions, and and uh, Craig and I went back and forth and uh, realized that neither one of us knew a whole lot about gauge R and R. So we thought we would uh, try to find somebody uh, who was an expert on gauge R and R. Unfortunately, uh, just happened to be really it was a coincidence <laughs> that our sponsor. Uh, PQ Systems happens to have a guy on staff who knows all about gauge R and R. So rather than Craig and I flubbing around pretending we know what we're talking about, we decided to bring on an expert. This is Eric Gasper from PQ Systems. Hey, Eric. Hello, gentlemen. How are you doing this afternoon? Pretty good. How are good. you? I'm doing very well. Thanks right. for having me on the show. Sure. Uh, well, Eric Gasper is a trainer and uh, technical support uh, expert from PQ Systems. Uh, before we get into the gauge R and R questions, can you just give us kind of an overview of what gauge R&R is and what it is trying to accomplish. Sure. Uh, a lot of the information that Craig was discussing uh, so far has been all about calibrations, which is going to be answering the question, is this particular gauge or tool, is it accurate or is it within my tolerances? And that's certainly a question they want to answer, but an R&R study can take that a bit further and can identify other areas of variation that in your entire measurement system. So questions about um, one company is using a particular tool and they're getting good parts. Another company is using the same type of a gauge and they're getting bad parts. So that question there is what is the difference? An R&R study can help identify where those pieces of variation are coming from. A lot of it could be the different gauges themselves. It could be the people that are using the gauges. It could be the method that they're using to work with the gauge. It could also be the environment. Is there uh, heat difference, temperature, magnetic fields, dust, vibrations, lots of different pieces that you would want to try and figure out. And an R&R &R study is an experiment that could hopefully help identify where those variations are coming from. So it, it's, looking at, uh, it's looking at the data, uh, uh, measurement data across different operators, uh, but all using the same, all using the same tools? Correct. In a typical R&R &R study, you're going to be taking one tool. You're going to have a couple of different appraisers. These are the people that are, are usually using that gauge out on the shop floor. And then you're going to be getting a sample of some of the parts that they're typically going to be measuring. So a typical study, you might have one to three appraisers. You're going to be using the same particular measurement tool. And then you're going to grab some samples from your regular production line. So it's an experiment to try and repeat the same conditions and process that you're normally doing your measurements with. Now, once you complete a study, you can actually examine and take a look at some of the different calculations, and it could give you a clue as to where uh, the most amount of variation is coming from, where it be it from the tool itself or being from maybe the appraisers. And then you could have a discussion with the people who are using the tool in an attempt to make the process better, make your entire measurement system uh, better overall. Okay, so so one one example of this might be when when Craig was talking about, and I get these confused. Uh, plug gauge. Yes, three plug gauge. Where you know one one operator's uh, idea of firm and another op or operator's idea of firm could be two totally different totally different things. Now, uh, or is this more related to actual variable measurements where there's actual numbers involved as opposed to touch? Well, it's actually going to play in for both. Uh, you can do an R&R &R study based solely on variables measurements. You can also do something called an attribute R&R &R study where it's going to be mostly for pass-fail. But you'll actually find when you're reviewing your results for an R&R &R study that you can identify which appraisers do have a soft touch versus a light touch. When you look at all of the data for all of their measurements, you'll see that some appraisers will be consistently low and some will be consistently high. And that could be an indication on how hard they're cranking down on a particular tool. Uh, it could also be that that person's maybe never been trained on the correct procedure. So all of those things go into figuring out where that variation is coming from and then creating a plan for correcting it. Okay. Uh, so let's get a couple to the, uh, to the couple of the specific questions that we had on, on Gage and R&R. &R. And if you can put up the, uh, the first one there. When measuring in inches, what kinds of things do we need to be able, do we need to do to be able to pass a gauge R and R less than twenty percent for four and five decimal places? 
Okay, that's actually a great question. And be, be, uh, first be, thing I'll make note about, depending be, on... Before we go sorry, there, go uh, t tell me first of all what that meant, less than 20%. What, is that, uh, what does that mean? Well, when it comes to the guidelines of an R&R &R study, there are usually a couple of things that you want to take uh, into consideration and, and kind of like an overall grade, like on a test. Uh, the, the typical guidelines are that any percent R&R &R that's less than 10%, you're doing rather well. Uh, that's probably going to be a pass for almost any company or any industry. Between 10 to 30% for your R&R, &R, that's going to be marginal acceptance meaning you're probably going to have to have a discussion with either the customer or your auditor to determine if that is going to go ahead and pass. Uh, in this particular question, they're asking about less than 20%. Uh, if I were to get an R&R &R study with 20%, I'd probably be happy because it's, it's within that marginal acceptance, but I would still come up with a game plan for making some improvements. So that way the next time I do my study, I'm now shooting for a, a lower score. And that's going to tell me that, yes, the changes I made were successful. Okay. So, sorry to interrupt there, but back to the question. No, not a problem. Um, so, in regards to the question about when you're using a tool and you're measuring in inches, uh, and you're measuring to the fourth or fifth decimal place, the resolution of a gauge could definitely play a big part in your overall results. However, it's not necessarily critical. If you're measuring maybe only to the first or second decimal place, you can still have a good R&R &R study, but that largely depends on the parts that you're measuring. If you're measuring some critical pieces with very, very little variation, then using a tool that will measure out to the fourth or fifth decimal place is probably what you're going to want to use. Uh, to answer the question in general, though, as far as a recommendation of things you might want to consider when you're setting up your R&R &R study, I would say first focus on the part selection themselves. What you want to do is get a random sampling of, say, about 10 of your parts that you're normally making and the reason why you want to get a random sampling is because you want to see if there is variation in your system and you also want to see if your gauge and your measurement system can identify when the parts are different. So if I wanted to go about this, I'd probably focus on my part selection. You could start gathering your parts usually a couple of weeks in advance, so that way you are getting a random sampling. Or, and this is a tip that comes from the inspection division of ASQ, you can actually, while you're doing your regular measurements, if you find some of your parts are close to your tolerances, just hold those back and that'll be part of your study group. Okay. Um, before we get to the next question, what is the, and this is just my own ignorance here, which there's plenty, um, is what is the difference between measurement uncertainty, which I know is somewhat related, I think, to, to gauge R&R, are these two related in any way or one's a subset of the other or something? They can be considered part of the same suite of experiments. Um, there's a couple different MSA, which is just measurement system analysis studies that you can conduct. Gauge R&R &R is one of them. It's actually one of the kind of larger ones that companies will actually participate in. But there's also a number of other ones, specifically an uncertainty test. Uh, the typical setup for this is you're going to be taking one gauge with one person, and you're going to be measuring a part over and over again, probably about 15 to 20 times. What you're looking for here is an average. And the uncertainty is going to be, are you having an, a high number on average or a low number on average based on the reference value of that part? So if I have a six-inch part, and I know it's a six-inch part, and I'm measuring this continuously, I'm going to be looking for that average to see if it's significantly high or significantly low from what that known reference value is. Now, a couple of other studies you can conduct, and this is actually something that uh, you were discussing earlier, is the idea of a study to determine if your calibration interval is going to be the best one moving forward. And uh, Craig gave a good answer, said, well, oh, it's going to be right from the last time you did a calibration, but something like a stability study, that could be used as soon as you're done with the calibration, you're going to be taking measurements periodically, probably every other couple of days with a known part. And as soon as you start to get measurements that are not close to that true value, that could be an indication that you need to do a calibration either shortening or lengthening that calibration interval. So there's a number of different studies in R&R, &R, uncertainty, stability. Those are all part of a suite of studies that you can do to answer a lot of questions about your gauges. Okay. Um, we had another question, I believe, on gauge R&R. &R. Ah, is, all right, well, we may have already touched on this. Is 20% reasonable for a passing value on a gauge R&R &R at four and five digits? 
Yes and no. Uh, I have to kind of almost give an answer that Craig kind of mentioned to earlier. It depends. <laughs> now, the general guidelines are between 10 to 30 percent for your R and R. It's going to be marginally accepted, uh, but it largely depends on the industry that you're adhering to, or a standard that you might be adhering to, and also the customer. If a customer requires you have an R and R percent that is less than a certain percent, and that's what you have to adhere to. If I were to receive an R and R study results that is 20 percent. I would still make plans to make adjustments or at least investigate where that variation is coming from, come up with a plan, talk with my users, implement the plan, and then I would do an R&R &R study again a few weeks months later to see if that change made a difference. Okay, and what are, what are some tools, uh, I'm assuming um, this would be kind of a shameless plug for PQ Systems, but that's okay. Um, I'm fine with that. <laughs> you're fine with that. So uh, th I'm assuming there are software tools of which I'm sure uh, uh, PQ Systems, uh, GagePack uh, has. What, what are some of the tools that are, that are useful for, for doing these kinds of, kinds of studies? Is there just a gauge r and assessment tool or that sort of thing? Yes, there are a lot of different types of softwares that can uh, calculate your results. Uh, typically, in the olden days, what you'd have to do for an R&R &R study was usually a couple different pieces. The first was preparing your study, meaning gathering all the different parts, your samples, uh, finding the right appraisers, scheduling the time to go ahead and do the study, and that was all the administrative work, getting things ready to conduct your study. Uh, the second step would be actually conducting the study, and there's a couple of uh, tips and regulations and rules that have to go with it. And then finally, you'd have to actually calculate the results. So you have all of your study data. Now we have to figure out those percentages. Well, luckily, software will take care of that step for you. Um, these, these MSA studies, these R&R studies, they're really just forms that you're filling out. So you can take a study and do all the results by hand, but first I'll tell you that it's going to take you a while. You have to double check all of your math. And there's a, still a possibility you can make a mistake at the very beginning and not ever catch it. So the benefit of using software is it makes that step very, very quick, very easy, and it's also very accurate. So there's a number of different software out there that can do R&R &R studies. Our program gauge pack, it can definitely take care of that for you. So again, shameless little plug, but still. Okay. Um, I would say moving forward, I don't know of any company that's probably doing these studies by hand. That would uh, just take too much time. Okay, thanks, Eric. Thank you.